Hello and welcome to our second Where To From Here event, Eight Things You Need To Know About The Economy. This series aims to reflect on the, risk, on the responses to the COVID-19 pandemic over the past 18 months and also envision ways that we will adapt going forward. Today, we're going to discuss the economic impact and responses to the pandemic across the past 18 months. My name is Sophie Ellis, and it's a pleasure to introduce our guest today, UTS Chief Economist and Industry Professor Tim Harcourt. In 2010 and 2020, I should say, Tim penned an article for the ABC about the eight ways he predicted the pandemic would change our economy. We're now 18 months on from those early days of the pandemic. So what's changed and what maybe hasn't? Tonight, Tim will be sharing with us the eight things we need to know about the economy. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral lands our city campus now stands, as well as, as the Darug people of the Eora Nation, where I'm speaking to you from today, and the Darawal Nation, where Tim is streaming from. I would like to pay respects to elders both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Now you can see Tim and I on your screen, and of course bear with us if we have any technical problems. Also please send through your questions. You can see the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll have some time at the end to put them to Tim. So let's begin. Now at the start of the pandemic, there was this notion that the, when the world eventually reopened, countries would invest more heavily in self-sufficiency. Tim, have we seen this occur? And how has this maybe been influenced by anxiety around China's dominance in global supply chains? It's interesting, Sophie, and, and thanks for your welcome and everyone for, uh, for, for tuning in. It, it's interesting, I, I interviewed for the uh, TV series after the pandemic on AusBiz, the head of uh, Ports New South Wales in Botany, at the Port of Botany, uh, Marika Kalfas, and, and she said things had never been so good uh, because she was seeing a massive amount of global shipping despite the pandemic. Mm. But she said most of it has, had been um, uh, containers full of um, uh, computers and building supplies because people were busily building home offices uh, they were investing in their in their home homes because they're not flying overseas, and uh, she actually found that uh, uh, there was a shortage of containers, uh, not only uh, in in terms of what was in the containers, but also the containers themselves. And we've seen some bottlenecks uh, in terms of in terms of global shipping. So that probably says to me that trade is going on. Um, there's exports of rocks and crops to China and the rest of Asia like ever, ever before when you think about mining and agriculture. And there's a lot of imports, uh, but things like tourism, uh, education have, have, have slowed down. And to some extent, I think because people got very uh, keen on uh, having ventilators and, and vaccines at home, we saw a lot of manufacturing companies in Australia sort of make the switch. Um, Gecko Systems in Ballarat that makes mining equipment, I've interviewed them in Brazil and, and places like that, they switched to making ventilators. Um, other, um, you know, uh, gin manufacturers like Archie Rose, which is local here, started making hand sanitizer. Uh, same with, with One Drop uh, Brewery here in, here in Botany. So we actually found that um, Australia had more manufacturing capability than we thought uh, because, you know, some anxiety about having to some extent a domestic supply chain, particularly in an emergency. In Australia over the last 18 months, national, the national unity that we observed in early 2020, it's at times been retired for a state-based alliance. What do you think could be some longer term economic impacts of this fracture? It's a really good question, Sophie. I, I thought 18 months ago when I first wrote that ABC article that yeah, we had the national cabinet formed. Um, Scott Morrison as prime minister was looking pretty good. He'd been through that terrible time during the bushfires where he went to Hawaii and he came back and sort of got the cold shoulder and said, you know, I don't hold a hose, mate, all this sort of stuff. And then he, he recovered. And then he looked quite good at the beginning of the pandemic. And he said, there's no red states or blue states. There's no red, no blue. It's just the national, you know, national unity is our purpose. And it looked really good at that stage. But I think 
Um, after many lockdowns, uh, the failure of the feds to get the vaccine rolled out efficiently and difficulty over quarantine means that we are seeing fraying at the edges. And I think as we, as we face a federal election uh, early next year, well, I don't think it'll be late this year now, I think early next year, you can now see some of the positioning between the feds and, and, and the states. And um, I mean, economically, people say, you know, there was a great economic case when all the Australian colonies federated because they thought there'd be more unity and we'd get our rail gauges right and our, our tariffs and taxes internally right. But you do have a bit of competitive federalism and uh, I don't think we've ever seen um, so many premiers and uh, chief health officers and chief ministers you know, in our lives daily, as we've seen during this uh, this crisis. I think at um, one stage, people always thought that um, the main job of the country is the prime minister and everyone wanted to go federal. But John Howard, despite being on the um, conservative side of politics, was quite a centralist like, like Gough Whitlam, but we've actually seen the states take uh, quite a preeminent leadership role for a better or for worse in, in, in the crisis. So I think uh, economically we've found ourselves in quite a different place to say the UK or, or New Zealand where they can act in a more sort of unified way. Mm. Now we've spoken about the first two things that we might need to learn about the economy, globalisation and the effects of the nation state. Let's turn to the third. What lessons about Australia's reliance on offshore and capacity for onshore production do you think the pandemic has instilled? It's an interesting question, uh, mm. Sophie. I think um, I think a lot of people said as soon as the pandemic hit, well, look, you know, the, the Europeans won't give us our vaccines. Uh, Italy and France were fighting, you know, despite European unity and so on. Uh, you know, France was holding up Italy's vaccines and, and vice versa. So a lot of people said, well, this is exactly, this is exactly why, you know, we should make all our vaccines here and just have uh, onshore capability. Um, I, I think um, what it probably demonstrates is that it is good to have some onshore capability, but it also shows that in terms of global supply chains, you do want to have some access to the global market. You know, we've seen uh, when we didn't have enough Pfizer, Poland stepped in or the UK uh, stepped in or Singapore stepped in. So I think it does show the importance of having efficient global supply chains uh, offshore as well as onshore, but not putting all your eggs in the one basket and having one nation, uh, you know, dominate the global supply chains. And that's, uh, that was some of the tensions I think we saw 18 months ago that to some extent are now working their, their ways out. And we're finding that um, we've probably got a lot more friends geopolitically than we thought. I mean, who would have thought 18 months ago that Poland would come to the rescue on, on, on Pfizer, uh, for instance. So uh, it, it does show that, uh, you know, having a, having a reasonable portfolio of, uh, of countries with, with similar interests and values mm. does help, you know, in, in a fractured world. Let's turn now to fiscal stimulus. In your original article published in April of last year, you considered that the federal government may choose to wait until the vaccine for the virus is developed before introducing stimulus to help kickstart the economy. Well, oh, how things have changed. <laughs> how has the pandemic maybe helped alleviate our tight grip on a defeat the deficit and debt mentality? And if it has done so, what are the consequences of this adjustment? Hasn't it been incredible? I mean, before mm -hmm. the pandemic, um, you know, Josh Frydenberg, the Treasurer, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison brought in the, you know, the back in black budget. You know, they even had the ACDC song as their, their slogan. Uh, and that became so important to them. Uh, and in some ways, the former Treasurer, uh, Wayne Swan, got in a lot of trouble uh, when he was, when Labor was in power, because he made this commitment to a surplus no matter what, you know, this sort of surplus fetish. And I remember very early in the pandemic, I said, the Sky, I said on Sky News, this is Josh Frydenberg's big chance to get off the hook, making this big back and black statement, you know, being, um, you know, hammered by um, the, the press like uh, uh, Wayne Swan was, he can, he can get out of it. And I remember in the Abbott government, uh, you know, two, two prime ministers before, 
Joe Hockey had uh, announced, you know, that we've just got to we've got to slay the the debt and deficit, you know, monster. And basically, they don't have to. They're basically off the hook with that now. They people recognise that when you're in a pandemic, when you're in a slump. But you need to have government stimulus and you need to have job keeping you need to have these types of measures so in some ways it's let jo uh, josh frydenberg off the hook having said that it's quite different than the global financial crisis um in the global financial crisis ken henry said to kevin rudd and the, and the labor government then you got to go early go hard and go household so they went with for the uh, what the press called the cash splash also the building of uh, uh, you know, school libraries and school gymnasiums and infrastructure that was uh, actually very important for building the education revolution. Uh, and uh, that worked quite well. But in a pandemic, well, there's certain things you, you're not out, you can't go out. So uh, the spending is not so, you know, not so readily available. So um, I, I think in some ways they've got a stagger, stagger it uh, according to vaccination levels. So if they do as what they're, they're planning to do, and that's getting vaccination levels you know, over 80, 90 percent, then they can start to stagger the stimulus according, accordingly. And, uh, but I mean, unfortunately, it's taken a pandemic, but I really think we, we won't hear that debt and deficit type mantra again with as much political teeth as it used to have, rightly or wrongly. Like you said, people now kind of acknowledge a little bit more the importance and the role of government stimulus then there's lots of effects that that can have on our economy but let's maybe break it down and i want to ask what are two key learnings that we can observe from the implementation of government stimulus in the past 12 months well i think obviously um getting money in the hands of of, of people as consumers is quite effective goes in the economy quite quite quickly um, allowing for the different implications of lockdown. Certainly, if you compare today's climate to the global financial crisis, uh, people are locked down, so they can't go out to, to to cafes and restaurants as readily as they could during the, the, the GFC. So that, that seems to work. But um, I, I think an important thing is what you do to help uh, help people on the at the business end. We saw JobKeeper very early brought in, and I think it was the idea of Greg Compe, who was actually a former ACTU Secretary and Labor Minister, to have to have JobKeeper, where you basically provided a shield so that you could help small business and keep their attachment uh, to their employee. Um, you know, the, the big worry was without JobKeeper is that people would be laid off, and then as the economy recovered, there'd be a big scramble to hire people back. And it was better to keep your employee's attachment to the one employer, much more efficient uh, in terms of providing a safety net for the employer and the small business. But also, as we came through a recovery phase, uh, you'd have a lot um, less transaction costs because people would already be attached to their employer. So I think we have learned that, that, that um, you know, consumer spending does help in uh, when there's a downturn, but I think we've also learned um, a lot about the employment relationship and how fundamental that is to uh, ensure you don't have as big a uh, downturn as you've had in other countries. Speaking of employment, initially it, it seemed as though COVID may gift us a bit more of an effective relationship do it between the Industrial Relations Minister and the trade unions. What do you think has led to these hopes maybe being a little short-lived? Yeah, it wasn't. I mean, last year, uh, I mean, I used to work for the ACTU, so I'm very nostalgic for Bob Hawke and Bill Kelty in the 1980s and 90s and, you know, consensus. So at one stage, it looked like, you know, Sally McManus and Christian Porter were having a, I don't know, you know, can't call it a bromance, but they had a, they had a good functioning relationship and it was mm. going very well with the employers and handled very well and, and all credit to, um, you know, to the trade union movement. Uh, but it just seems to have fractured to, to some extent. And I think um, you had the difficulty with some employers trying to, you know, at least the Business Council of Australia talking about labour market reform, you know, individual contracts. And when the labour market's very fragile, uh, and when you have casual employment at a very fragile state that's that's not helpful and then we even have had the issue about vaccination uh mm. does the government mandate or employers to insist that the employees be vaccinated uh such as 
SPC and Shepparton or Qantas insisting upon it. Uh, and it seems to, you know, the, the Labor Council of, or Unions New South Wales, Mark Morrie has been good at, you know, getting leave for workers for vaccination uh, and also uh, giving them time, particularly in those uh, hotspot LGA areas. But uh, uh, in some ways, the feds have left it to employees and the unions to, uh, to work out, which, which could be problematic because you could end up with, a, with two labour markets in, in effect, one that's vaccinated and one that's, that's not. Uh, and in some ways, that probably is something uh, perhaps for the, for the federal government to show leadership on. Social distancing has had an impact on essentially every sector of the economy. Does this present us with a rare opportunity to innovate and reform in some way? And which sectors do you think have maybe taken this opportunity up well so far? Yeah, the old tyranny of social distance uh, we, we found. I mean, obviously it's affected sports and the arts, uh, tourism and, and education. I think what's interesting is that um, in what we're doing today, um, the University of Technology Sydney has been very advanced in online teaching and research uh, and had already, you know, already taken steps in this direction. And in fact, the, uh, I, I think in some ways UTS was very well set up for COVID hitting because they'd already gone down this, this track of using a lot of online uh, tools and technology. So, you know, all credit to UTS for being ahead of the curve on this. But I, I certainly think um, uh, things like education uh, can be, you know, can use COVID as an, uh, an opportunity to really reform, you know, technical and further education, vocational education and, and, and universities. And, you know, some industries, uh, some industries are obviously looking uh, more to hybrid models of uh, of online and face-to-face. -face. And I think even if we get vaccination up, uh, uh, even if we, um, you know, we see uh, the Delta virus, you know, reducing, I still think there will be some degree of, of, of social distancing now in our lives and in our economy. So uh, it might be, it might not be as uh, extreme as it was when the virus first hit, but there will be, will be some, uh, some, some impact for it. Um, I was watching a college football game the other day, University of Wisconsin, and it was full uh, and people got quite worried uh, about the huge crowds. But Dane County, Madison, Wisconsin is 98% vaccinated, uh, which is quite different to say Arkansas, Virginia, some of the other games where, where, where they're not. So it'd be interesting to see to what extent we we're gonna see crowds to quite that extent or whether there'll be some degree of social distancing, even when we have high vaccination levels. It's funny you mentioned football because we're about to move into uh, a beautiful term that you have coined, footynomics. Yeah, my favourite term. Yes, it's a wonderful yeah. term. Now, <laughs> comparisons between the value placed on sport and the lack thereof for the arts have been rife throughout the entire pandemic period. But what might these discussions indicate about broader trends in the Australian economy as we emerge from harsh restrictions? It's extraordinary. Yes, I mean, I've been looking at the footynomics figures today and I've been looking at all the codes because Australia and particularly Sydney has got this incredible situation where we have four football codes. You know, we have Aussie rules, we have rugby league, we have union and soccer. Whilst most countries, you only have one or two and it's usually soccer that dominates like in Europe or, or in South America or rugby as in New Zealand or Wales or, or South Africa or American football. But in Australia, we've got all of them and um, all, all not just fighting for uh, hearts and minds of, of young people, um, young girls and young boys, but also you've got, uh, they're, also, they're also competing for advertising, media inches, uh, corporate sponsorship, and it's been it's been quite extraordinary. I think in Australia we have one of the highest numbers of professional sports clubs in the world because we have you know, eighteen AFL clubs, and now we have eighteen AFLW clubs, and we have uh, the same with the NRL. We've almost you know doubled uh, our our um, numbers of clubs in the last in the last ten years. So it's a lot to go around, and I think that's why even in a pandemic. Um, the NRL and the AFL 
move people around. Uh, you know, the NRL have moved up all their finals up to Queensland. Um, yeah, the AFL has finally realised that you can have a grand final away from the, the MCG and they're going to Perth this year and, and the Gabba last year in Brisbane. And, and so that you can see financially why they found it so important for the show to go on, even with, you know, in cases in, in Melbourne in, in empty stadiums. Now, the arts doesn't quite have that financial pull. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you look at um, the types of numbers and the types of uh, fanaticism, but it does have um, some opportunity now. I was thinking uh, with, with, with music now being quite different, if you think about um, a band of my youth, ABBA, <laughs> you know, they've now put together, you know, a new album, you know, they're, they're streaming it um, through avatars or avatars uh, electronically uh, around the world. So I think to some extent, I find the arts quite interesting because they've still got all the online and electronic tools at their disposal, even if they don't have live audiences, uh, but they haven't been given quite the same favours that um, the sports people have been given. I mean, uh, you know, Queensland went out of its way to get the AFL to have the grand final up in uh, Queensland last year and all the finals and, uh, and their families lived up there. And similarly with Western Australia, I mean, I mean, the Western Australian Premier has been the strictest Premier in terms of COVID, but um, they're having the grand final uh, at, at this stage. So, so there, it does show the, the pull of sport in, in Australia. Um, Although I've got to say, Sophie, I'm one of these people that loves the arts and music and, and sport all at the same time. Um, like, like Brazilians, you know, Brazilians can have a sports minister who's also the arts minister. And uh, <laughs> I, I think it's all, it's all a form of culture and entertainment in, in a different guise. So I think, I think they should be you know, treated consistently in some ways. Yeah, do you think we could ever get to a place where the arts had a similar economic pull to sport in Australia? I think... Um, what happens with the arts is that um, the ones who have been successful, even if you go back to the Heidelberg School and some of the uh, some of those painters a hundred years ago, mm. they had a few strings to their bow. You know, Tom Roberts and uh, uh, Hans Heisen, they were quite entrepreneurial and uh, they were very good at getting sponsorship and benefactors. They're also very good at branding themselves uh, on on different things. And uh, uh, I think even before Don Bradman started you know selling cricket gear and insurance those artists were very very good at, at promoting themselves uh yeah, similar to the ones that yeah, went, went overseas so i think uh, i i think in the same way that um a lot of uh, a lot of rock stars now have different brands and products uh uh i think in, in a way they've you know they've sort of diversified their um their port portfolio uh, in terms of endorsements and so on, so I think that's probably the, the arts will the arts will will blossom when we sort of follow the the model that the Heidelberg School followed, um, ten, you know, you know, a hundred years ago, being great painters but also great entrepreneurs as well. Mm. Now you've coined a beautiful turn of phrase, putting the green back in green and gold. We like that. It's good. I love that. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask, rebuilding, reconstruction, regeneration, all these terms we're using now, they all imply a sense of emerging from this time with something new. How can we use this to embrace more environmentally sustainable ways of doing things? And where can you see this being done already? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, Sophie, my own little funny story was that when the pandemic hit, you know, I had this TV show, The Airport Economist, what go to Brazil and uh, the UK and uh, China and India, looking at what Australian companies were doing overseas. And then the pandemic hit and we can't travel and, and so on. And Department of Foreign Affairs had asked me to do a show on the bushfires. Uh, and, um, and I went around in Australia to the bushfire affected areas and, Kangaroo Island and uh, southern New South Wales and so on. And then they said, well, can you do the bushfires? Can you do the drought? Can you do floods? Uh, and can you do COVID? And it sort of became the crisis and recovery series. And then I noticed that uh, uh, in southern New South Wales and in, in South Australia, as people were rebuilding their homes, they were 
using environmental materials. They were using new forms of low carbon energy. They were sort of building back uh, better. Um, and so I thought, well, let's make a climate innovation series because we seem to have got this opportunity. You know, if everything's burnt to the ground and you've got to build it back up, then you can use clean energy. You know, you can actually, you can actually start again. And that's where the, you know, putting the green back in the green and gold um, phrase came from because I was noticing that um, not only overseas, but within Australia, a lot of our companies, a lot of our exporters actually doing a lot of low carbon things and uh, providing great forms of new renewable energy, but we didn't, their stories weren't being told. We didn't know much about them because all the climate change debate was all about, you know, Paris and targets and Greta, you know, how dare you and all this sort of stuff. But when you actually talk to a lot of companies, they were doing you know, quite magnificent things, whether it be hydrogen, uh, whether it be the, uh, the batteries up in, South Australia, the, the changes in Wyla. Um, there was a, a Czech migrant that uh, was an architect who spent all his time finding people that lost their homes in bushfires and offering to build back their homes with uh, renewable materials. So I was quite, I was quite amazed by um, the extent to which people built back in an environmentally sustainable manner. So I thought, well, perhaps, you know, perhaps these types of it gives you a bit of a chance to rebuild back, you know, with your, you know, with your climate hat on, uh, as well as your, as well as your, you know, let's let's get the show back on the road type of type of mentality. And so I thought, I thought, let's tell their stories because um, when people get depressed about targets and so on, let's have a look at what's uh, actually being done because that's where you're going to get the momentum from. Yeah, like you said, these times of crisis can often be the like the push, the momentum, the opportunity to redo things in a new way, in a more environmentally sustainable way. Do you think the economic fallout and, and the changes that we've seen occur to our economy from COVID-19 could potentially make environmentally, environmentally sustainable ways of doing things more economically viable for companies? Do you think more people are going to buy into environmental sustainability uh, during this time of rebuilding? I think they already are. Uh, mm. And I think uh, it's partly COVID, but it's partly uh, some of the you know, recent crises we've had. But I think it's almost uh, a byproduct in a way. Um, people are finding under COVID when they were in lockdown that um, they're sort of discovering the local areas a bit more. Um, I did something during COVID which um, I used to do as a kid, which is called go to a park. You know, like, uh, like I said, my, my children said to me, oh, you know, what, um, you know, what computers did you have when you were a kid, Dad, you know? And I said, we used to, we used to tie a tyre to a tree and swing over a creek and play cricket in the park and make go-karts. They were just amazed. So I've actually found that, um, you know, my local area, um, everyone taking their kids to the park again, uh, people finding that... Um, uh, being around the local area is actually pretty good. Um, believe it or not, um, when I was a kid, you didn't go to restaurants every night. Um, you know, you went once a year, if it was, you know, mum's birthday or something. Uh, and so I think people are, you know, there, there, are, there is a change of values and people realising that uh, you can do a lot of things locally. You're seeing, you're seeing, seeing less congestion on the roads from commuting because people are working from home doing school from home. So I think there is some, some, some adjustment. Um, obviously the property developers and the CBD don't like it very much. They want everyone to go back to work, but uh, yeah, in the suburbs and the regions, there's probably been some quite positive spin-offs. And um, I think too, to some extent, um, the working from home option seems to be a good hybrid for a lot of, for, for a lot of people. I think some people find it quite isolating, but some people are finding that their productivity is gone up so it might be that we do we have a bit more of a, a hybrid model in in future and uh, I think Bernard Salt was saying about 10 percent of people work from home before the pandemic and during the pandemic it it, it you know is up to 30 percent in some areas where people can and um, they're finding that productivity wise it was actually reasonably beneficial so I think you know indirectly those things will help the environment but they're being done for other reasons. 
Um, we have a few more questions to close out our discussion before we move into a time of Q&A, but this is just a reminder for everyone watching uh, to put in your questions for Tim. We're going to have some time um, to ask your questions, um, so get them in before it's too late. <laughs> what is one positive impact of the pandemic on our economy that you hope to see continue into the future? I think, Sophie, some of the things that we've been talking about with um, uh, a consciousness of, of the environment and perhaps a revival of the regions, uh, perhaps less long commuting, uh, perhaps a bit of a hybrid between working from home and, and having social interaction uh, in your workplace. And I think for a lot of people that were perhaps um, a little bit shy about Technology, you know, I have a seven year old daughter who's a whiz on Zoom. So, you know, she's been educating me. I think a lot of people have sort of stepped up and realised that they can do a lot of these things they're a little bit, you know, terrified to do before. So I think we are perhaps seeing some things sped up uh, that we that we didn't we, we didn't expect. Now, you, you wish for, you know, you wish forever you don't have another pandemic or anything like it to make this happen. But now that it's occurred, perhaps, you know, there is an opportunity to have some productivity gains and some improvements in, 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 in work, work family life as a result. But, uh, you know, obviously um, there seems to be a lot of fatigue from lockdowns, particularly in uh, Victoria and, and, and here, in, here in Sydney where we've had one long one. Victoria's had almost six, you know, reasonably lengthy ones as well. So I think, uh, I think clearly people are are keen to come out of that as vaccination rates improve, but we have learned some, some, some things that we can we can take forward. If we can maybe take the liberty to give our imagination a little bit of a workout, in one year's time, what do you imagine will be the eight things we need to know about the economy then? That's a big one, isn't it? So, <laughs> so, so be really interested to see where China is in a year's time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Josh Frydenberg, the treasurer, made an important speech today about this. You know, this we've got to deleverage from China now. I don't think we can. I mean, I think that uh, even if you look at the Peter Varghese report on how important India will be in the future, you know, by 20, 20, uh, 2032, we're still going to be, you know, a third of where China's at. So. Uh, I, I think to some degree, uh, we're going to see more diversity in our trading partners, but China will still be very important. And hopefully the rhetoric would have died down and we'll come to uh, some accommodation. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, the world trade system will be, um, will be more, more, in, more in balance as we, you know, as countries vaccinate and come out of the, come out of the, the, the pandemic. So I'm hoping for more stability in the international system and a, uh, and a um, uh, more of less rhetoric and more substance in our relationship with with China and our other trading partners in Asia and uh, and uh, emerging markets. So I think that would be probably the uh, the main thing that I want to imagine could happen in in a year's time, uh, particularly uh, as you know we have a little bit more stability in the international trading system. Well, we've had a lot of yeah discussions great great discussions and i might just take us back over the eight things that we have learned number one will this be the end of globalization as we know it potentially not <laughs> a reset don't you think a re not yes a reset for sure two the nation state is back or is it we've had our conversations about um, the impact of state-based alliance. Number three, foreign investment. Four, the fiscal stimulus and learning to uh, let go of defeating the debt and deficit. Five, labour pains, uh, looking at our labour market. Six, the tyranny of social distance. Seven, footynomics and the arts end of the world. And eight, putting the green back in the green and gold. You do now, better. We I <laughs> Good. Now, we have some fantastic questions uh, streaming in. So I think now's the perfect time to move into the Q&A. Firstly, I want to start with Kate Cooper's question. 
uh, who says, Tim, do you believe the government should be supporting industries like tourism that are really struggling through no fault of their own due to customers being locked down or locked out? It's a great question. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think in the ABC article I wrote a year ago, uh, most of the analysts were thinking that, yes, international borders would close, but here's our chance to see Australia first. And people were touting the Kimberleys and Kangaroo Island and going off and seeing the Northern Hairy Nose Wombat and all these sorts of things. Um, but of course, our state borders have been shut as well. So probably the big surprise for me and a lot of other analysts compared to 18 months ago has been, it's been really hard on domestic tourism. Uh, so um, I actually think um, given that, you know, Qantas and, and Virgin have had some support, there, there has to be some sort of way of helping domestic tourism. Now, um, you know, hopefully as we get vaccination rates higher, uh, hopefully, um, you know, Western Australia will, will, will uh, respond at the end of the year so that we can have more domestic tourism. But uh, I, I think the tourism industry has been a little bit forgotten uh, in, in all of this. And uh, it's very labour intensive. It's uh, not usually high pain, relies a lot on casual and uh, seasonal work. So it must be very, very for a lot of tourism operators um, right now. Um, I was talking to Chuck McCoy, who's in McLaren Vale, and of course his whole industry, his whole business is geared up on, uh, you know, looking at the, um, the Darrenberg Cube and going around McLaren Vale. And uh, he's been very dependent on, on international and, and indeed he thought he'd have regional tourists you know, picking up the slack, but it hasn't occurred because of the state border closures. So I think that's a very good question and very important that um, we have a look at tourism exporters from that point of view. Jay Adams asks, do you think people's spending habits will have permanently changed from this time? Things like buying in bulk, spending locally, traveling regionally, or are people going to slip back into their old habits? Oh, that's a, it's a beauty, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I think that uh, um, I think people <laughs> I think people have maintained their allegiance to Dan Murphy's uh, during the pandemic. Uh, I, mean, I, I talked to my local store and he said, "Well, before the pandemic, it was pretty good. Now it's sensational." Mm. Uh, so I think I think some some habits will, will continue. I, I do suspect that we will, um, to some extent, uh, do a lot more home entertainment uh, when it comes to. Uh, dining and and cooking and uh, I think people have recognised the the uh, benefits of online shopping. Yeah. With with tourism, um, I, I do hope the borders domestically do open up and people do look at more environmental tourism. You know, looking at local wildlife and and so on. But it's very hard to keep Aussies off an international trip. You know, so I think. Uh, Eventually, when there are vaccine passports and when there's relationships with different countries, I think I, I think you will ultimately see Australians whizzing around the world. I think per capita, Australians and New Zealanders are the biggest, uh, you know, frequent flyers, mainly because of the distance we have to travel to to go to different places. But I, I think that will I think that will that will come back, but probably not as frequent. And um, I do think that corporate travel have realised um, uh, to what extent you need. You know, to, to travel to do to do to meetings and negotiations. I actually, um, my TV show, The Airport Economist, is owned by David Koch, and he was saying the other day how great it is when I'm doing it just in the studio. And uh, I really want to dissuade him of that. That uh, there are times when you just have to be there, particularly when it's The Airport Economist in Rio. Um, it's important to have face-to-face -face, uh, relationships. Simon Bennett asks, what are the major equity challenges emerging from the pandemic? Really good question, Simon. I think I mean, uh, globally, there's obviously issues with vaccines and, and developing countries and uh, people are trying to get a, get, a, get a grip on that internationally. And I imagine the international institutions will be very wary of that. Um, Domestically, I think the main thing is the, the labour market. I, I think what we've seen is uh, people in um, casual parts of the labour market 
uh, whether they be uh, casual employees or small business owners, they're very exposed to the pandemic and the policy implications of closing down businesses, whilst people who have relatively permanent uh, white collar jobs that they can do from home uh, have been in a relatively you know, good position. So I, I, I think people in um, casual jobs, it's been very tough on them. I think people in caring professions, uh, healthcare, aged care, um, these are predominantly jobs um, held uh, by women in the labour market. Uh, when I worked at the ACTU, where we did equal pay cases, what we did in many cases was improve the pay for skill in areas like uh, family daycare, childcare, aged care, as well as in parts of manufacturing, because that would actually benefit uh, predominantly women workers if we, if, we, if, we, if we did that. So I think uh, areas what like uh, uh, caring professions can be quite tough on, on, on workers in those areas. Uh, and that's something equity wise we have to we ha we have to watch and uh, I think we've seen it here in Sydney you know most of the LGAs that have been locked down are pretty much people that work in construction you know they travel around the the, the city and you know they need the permits for that for their work and we've seen some of that you know exposed in this in this in this city so we do have to be you know wary of that as we uh, you know we, we, we rebuild our labor market coming out of COVID. Continuing our conversations about the labour market, John Burgess asks, how likely are we to see a clear distinction in the labour force between those vaccinated and those unvaccinated? Outside of healthcare professionals, which sectors would foreseeably demand vaccination from their employers? It's a really good question. Um, I, I suspect that some of the big corporations, Qantas for instance, will insist upon it. And um, I, I suspect universities will too, uh, particularly when there's, you know, uh, people working alongside e each other. And some people will see it as a health and safety issue that, you know, I expect a safe workplace, I expect a, a, vac a vaccinated workplace. So I think that this will be a real issue. I know that the Labor Council Unions New South Wales has been at the forefront of how, how, to, how to deal with this. Uh, and uh, I suspect it will be something that people will make um, you know, a, a standard of, of employment. Um, I, was, I was listening to a report from Italy about vaccination and uh, basically the government was saying, uh, you know, if you're, not gonna, if you're not gonna get vaccinated, it's no job, no church, no cafe, no restaurant, no soup for you. You know, it was sort of straight out of, straight out of Seinfeld, you know, so some, some countries are going pretty hard on that, on that mandated on that mandated question. So, uh, you know, I think, I think it's uh, something really to watch. I suspect the, the large employers will, will go first and, and some of the public employers. COVID-19 pandemic has obviously seen large effects on the housing market, uh, something that was already, you know, troubled uh, previously to the pandemic. We have an anonymous, anonymous question that's asked, would building more social housing be an effective fiscal stimulus? One of my colleagues at the Institute for um, Public Policy and Governments, Alan Morris, is probably Australia's preeminent expert on, on, on public housing and he's, he's made comments uh, to, 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 this, to, to this effect. Um, investing in Australia is all about red bricks and blue chips. Uh, one reason uh, you know, we see investment the way it is in, in, in Australia is people know if they buy mining shares, they'll do pretty well in a mining boom. People know that there's always a property boom ongoing in Australia and that's why we see incredible investments in in property, helped obviously by negative gearing and some of the, uh, you know, some of the tax arrangements that that, that we have. Uh, so I expect that the the housing market um, will, will continue to be strong. And we've been seeing uh, cities like Hobart. You know, it used to just be all about Sydney, but now you're seeing other capital cities and some of the regions also performing quite strongly in, in the property market. You know, so to some extent, if you're concerned about equity, the only way to go is, uh, is the stimulatory effect of public housing. Now, I come from South Australia and the Housing Trust, you know, was one of the you know, greatest um, social policy 
policy experiments ever ever tried in in a, in a, in a, in a Western society and was very very successful, particularly in a in a state like South Australia as it was growing its manufacturing after the after the war under a Liberal Premier, Sir Thomas Playford, and uh, public housing was very much part of that stimulus and also part of the social structure. And it created cold chisels, so it can't be all bad. <laughs> Simon Be Bennett asks another question uh, about reform. Oh, sorry, my chat has just flicked down to the bottom. Let me get it back up. <laughs> mm. Nope, I think that question has been deleted. That's okay, we'll move on to a different one. Another anonymous question. Do you think that our essential workers will be recognised for their essential services to Australians and be rewarded with better rates of pay? Yeah, look, I, I think there's a very good case for that. Um, I was on the Fair Work Commission that sets the minimum wage and um, I, think, I, I, I think there'd be a very good case for a special case for essential workers uh, to be better rewarded for the work they do. I'm sure they'll be nominated for Australian of the Year if they haven't already, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, which is nice, but uh, you know, it'd be better to have a pay rise and better have recognition uh, for the skills and also the risk they put to uh, keep, everyone, keep everyone safe. And uh, one thing when you think about it, I mean, COVID-19 is the biggest externality and people say, well, I want to be free and I want to make the decision not to vax or to vax. Well, it's not a decision that just affects uh, an individual, it all affects everyone else and most of all the emergency workers that are going to have to look after everyone that's uh, been infected. So, uh, you know, I think that's a very good question and an uh, important case could be, could be made, uh, you know, for, you know, for a wage rise based on the incredible productivity and effort and risk they put to uh, help society. Stefan Wagner has a question about importation. How can we encourage government procurement to better support locally manufactured goods rather than simply buying cheap imported stuff? So some people use government procurement as a way of stimulating local industry. Uh, the difficulty is, is, is if every country does it, um, because Australia is quite a small country, you've you know, Germany and the United States and Brazil uh, and China and India did it all. Uh, you know, Australia Australia would would struggle. Having said that, there is a deal. There is still a, to some extent, some uh, local procurement. And I think, to some extent, in Australia, uh, people do go for high quality. And uh, I think the Australian Made campaign nowadays is more about choose Australian because it's high quality, not just because it's Australian. And uh, I think that seems to have more effectiveness in, uh, in helping local industry than uh, a pure mandate to buy Australian because you must. It's the same sense that, um, you know, um, people, people, uh, people love the Australian film industry because they made incredibly good films and everyone wasn't just Australians who have seen it, but the whole world wanted to see it. And I think that's the same principle with, uh, with local procurement. Mark England asks, do you have any thoughts about the trends in wealth distribution in Australia, where it's headed and its associated impacts? It's a very good question. Um, there's a few ways to look at it. Um, one is uh, intergenerational, because uh, there's the distribution of income and the, different, the, the distribution uh, of, of assets. And obviously the, the tax system, uh, the negative gearing and our discussion before about property means that um, um, the baby boomers, uh, God love them, um, you know, do very, very well. So there's a, a question we have over intergenerational uh, wealth, which I think is to do with the, uh, the tax system and, and home ownership schemes. And then there's uh, uh, income distribution across regions and across occupational groups. I think um, um, the labour market, um, trade unions, the Fair Work Commission can do some good uh, in terms of improving people's wages, particularly in, in low income areas. Uh, but I think uh, they can do a lot of work on incomes, but a lot of it's to do as well to the, to, to the tax system as well. And in regions, um, well, look, I mean, you know, 
Sydney, Melbourne, uh, the main capital cities do, do dominate. But um, we have seen some improvement in the regions uh, in, 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 in jobs and also in housing uh, during the pandemic. So uh, uh, to some extent, um, we have a, lot, a, long, a long way to go in terms of some of the capacity of improving, improving the regional areas and the, and the cheaper capital cities like Adelaide, where I'm from and, and Hobart, uh, there's obviously a lot more capacity there uh, for jobs and, and housing and, uh, and economic development. We might end on this question about the nation state. What impacts do you think the pandemic has had on our sense of togetherness as a nation, our sense of social cohesion? What areas have we come closer together and in what areas might we, why, might we be moving further apart? So it's a wonderful question and a great way to sort of sum it all up. I mean, uh, people used to say the nation state was withering away but when COVID hit, people went straight for their, for their national governments. I mean, the European Union really struggled and, you know, France and Italy and Germany were squabbling over vaccines with the UK and so on. So, you know, these super national organisations like the World Health Organisation, the EU and the UN didn't save us. We sort of looked towards our, our national, national governments. Um, some of the pluses have been, um, Australians have been pretty tolerant of the restriction in our civil liberties. You know, we have locked down, we have uh, stayed home. Um, there's been very few fines, very few um, altercations relatively. There's been a few on the news, but very small. There's been very low number of deaths and Australians have been pretty pretty compliant and, um, you know, pretty, pretty publicly spirited about it all. I don't think it can be tested. You know, I think our patients will be tested forever, but. So far, so good. Um, in terms of fractions, I think it's not just pandemic related, but um, to some degree, social media has divided our politics. Um, I find um, on things like Twitter, the extreme elements of our political debate get a lot of attention. Um, now that media has been um, balkanized, um, you know, you almost have political parties have their own media outlets. While where I grew up, I was used to media outlets sort of reporting both sides. So I think that's probably where um, I've seen a bit of fracture. Having said that, uh, in this country, there seems to be the bulk of the, the sensible centre uh, on centre left and centre right of reasonably rational people that come together and they're the people that vote. And when you have compulsory voting, and when you have preferential, preferential voting, that tends to be the result that you get. And for the most part, the debates have been pretty, pretty rational and pretty, pretty sensible. And there's a bit of funny stuff happening on the fringes, but it's not, it's not the majority of Australians. Mm. We're going to wrap up our discussion there, but a big thank you to our Chief Economist, Tim Harcourt, for joining us today. And thank you to all of you for your valuable questions and insights as well. This webinar will be posted to YouTube soon, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you and good night.